All it takes is one mistake. That's the U.S. Secretary of State's warning, except Antony Blinken wasn't talking about the showdown over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He was speaking before flying out on a mission to restore dialogue with China. Uh, so that our two countries responsibly manage our relationship, including by discussing challenges, by addressing misperceptions, and avoiding miscalculations. Avoiding miscalculations. Could it really spiral out of control? Increasingly militarized standoffs in the Pacific, just part of the picture as Blinken became the highest ranking U.S. official to visit Beijing in five years, a trip that was pushed back at the start of the year uh, when a Chinese spy balloon was shot out of the sky over U.S. territory. Are the tensions about Taiwan, trade, both, if you consider that more than half the world's semiconductors are manufactured by Taipei, and that Beijing remains the world's factory, for now at least. But that's starting to sour. Foreign investment slowing as U.S. allies watch Washington employ a carrot-and-stick approach to push key industries to reshore their activities. The United States not alone, as the German chancellor hosts his Chinese counterpart for dinner. Olaf Scholz knows that his biggest export markets no longer flavor of the month with EU partners. Voter backlash over decades of outsourcing of jobs and industry to a country that's uh, subsidies are its key uh, sectors now met by uh, if you can't beat them, join them approach to these state subsidies, both here in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, are subsidies an overdue response to help level of the playing field or will decoupling with China and uh, fueling it? Uh, with uh, uh, those uh, subsidies help spiral tensions that Anthony Blinken uh, wants to diffuse. Today in the France 24 debate, can the U.S. and China dial it down? With us, uh, Pierre-Antoine Tenet, former uh, business, uh, uh, former bureau chief, rather, in uh, Beijing for the French news agency AFP. Um, you're the author of World Leadership in the Balance, China and the U.S. and the Clash for Supremacy. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thank you to invite me. Uh, André Lezekouk Petri is president of the Joint European Disruptive Initiative, which works on supporting EU projection, projects and innovation. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you, François. Uh, we're with uh, from Stuttgart, academic and author uh, Diane Wei Liang. Thank you for being with us. Hi, good evening. And we hope to be joined by Ralph Winnie of the uh, Eurasia Center uh, from Washington. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. It's what happens behind closed doors that matters. Anthony Blinken's trip follows last month's reports of a discreet visit by the CIA director uh, to China. Gavin Lee has more on the follow-up to uh, that no November meeting between Joe Biden uh, first for uh, Biden as U.S. president with his Chinese counterpart on the sidelines of the G20. A greeting of ni hao from Antony Blinken, a handshake, but notably no small talk for the cameras. Courteous, professional, but a long way from friendship. Both governments trying to halt the downward slide in relations. But a symbolic reaching out from President Xi, going against protocol, which dictates leaders only meet other heads of state. A notable diplomatic gesture in Beijing's Great Hall of the People. Here at the center of the table, he says, I hope, Secretary of State, you will now make more positive contributions to stabilizing the China-US relationship. After the 35-minute meeting, Antony Blinken told reporters the U.S. was clear-eyed about the challenges posed by the Chinese government. I stress that direct engagement and sustained communication at senior levels is the best way to responsibly manage our differences and ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And I heard the same from my Chinese counterparts. We both agree on the need to stabilize our relationship. Earlier in the day, the Secretary of State met face to face with a far more openly vocal critic of the US, his counterpart, Wang Yi. He blamed the current malaise on Joe Biden hyping up the China threat. Washington says the three hour meeting focused on how to calm tensions with North Korea, an agreement for Beijing not to arm Russia in Ukraine, and an apparent warning against Chinese encroachment upon self ruled Taiwan. This meeting was second time lucky, the first postponed days after this suspected Chinese spy balloon was downed above Alaska. No deals or big expectations here, more an agreement in broad principle. And to talk again, ideally president to president. 
it's just a visit, but uh, Andre Lezikovic Pietri, can we talk about a de escalation? Well, actually, when you look at the whole Biden strategy since, since months, it always was about sending mixed messages. Sometimes when you read the press, you have the impression that there's a bipartisan, you know, very aggressive stance. I mean, we remember President Trump really launched a kind of an ideological war on, on, on China. And the Biden administration has been much more balanced. And, you know, this, this trip by Anthony Blinken, if there were not the, the story of the balloons that were shut down over the U.S. a couple of months ago, uh, this trip would have happened uh, much earlier. So it's in the interest currently of the U.S. not to have two fronts at the same time, one in Ukraine with Russia and obviously one in the Pacific. So there's a kind of a balancing act between protecting America's interest and preeminence in the Pacific, and especially with this core uh, heat point of uh, flashpoint of Taiwan, and on the other side, not antagonizing. Uh, and when you look at uh, the, 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 the strategy papers, the Indo-Pacific strategy, I think, was early 2022, it, uh, the U.S. clearly stated we are not here to change the nature of the regime in, in, in the public Republic of China. So I think it's just a relatively coherent approach uh, this administration has followed. A coherent approach. Uh, uh, let's listen to the reaction from the hosts, China's president, uh, who spoke uh, about stabilizing uh, ties. He struck a conciliatory tone. Interactions between states should always be based on mutual respect and sincerity. I hope that Secretary Blinken, through this visit, can make a positive contribution to stabilizing China-U.S. relations. The two sides have also made progress and reached agreements on some specific issues. This is very good. So that was the Chinese president. When Blinken met uh, China's foreign policy chief uh, before that, Wang Yi uh, was uh, more blunt. He said, uh, for instance, quote, uh, China has no room for compromise or concessions when it comes uh, to uh, Taiwan. Uh, Diane Wei Liang, uh, which is the real tone inside uh, uh, the Chinese government? Well, with the Chinese government and, and with the U.S.-China relationship, it's always very complicated. And there are lots of um, coded messages here. And I must say, in my view, uh, the uh, Biden approach, nor is the uh, President Xi's approach, is in any way coherent. Um, I believe the two countries are in some ways, suddenly come at a crossroad where previous policies have um, run into a brick wall. And China has been taking a very strong diplomatic approach. In the past, it seemed to have worked. And same for the US. And suddenly, and the tone changes. And both countries find themselves in a position where they need to find new strategies. And this meeting, um, in my view, is very much the beginning of two superpowers trying to find new approaches and in their new places in the world order, and they're testing each other. So the conversation here is not of old friends, or, nor is new enemies. It is testing the water and to see in which direction, in what way this relationship can work. It is, of course, to both countries' interest and that um, the risk and the tension between the two superpowers will be contained. And, but how to do so and in what way that can happen and how that relationship relates to international um, policies such as Russia, Ukraine, and, and economic development. Those are the things that need to be ironed out going forward. Pierre-Antoine Denis, uh, both sides needed, do you agree with that? Both sides needed this meeting uh, because it's bad for business for both sides if it spins out of control. Is that how you read what's going on right now? Well, that's obviously one of the reasons, but this is not the only one. Uh, I tend to have a different approach 
uh, compared to what was just said. Uh, it's not finding a new strategy. They know each other quite well. Uh, this uh, trip was intended to uh, uh, f try to find out how to, re to restore confidence. The confidence has been lost for a long time already. Uh, Mr. Wang Yi also said yesterday, uh, today, I'm sorry, that uh, the, the uh, U.S.-China relationship is at the lowest point since 1979. This is when the two countries uh, forged uh, diplomatic relations. Normalized relations. Right. Uh, what they are trying to do, and this is really the hope from the American side, is uh, as they talked about between Joe Biden and uh, Xi Jinping in uh, the G20 uh, meeting in Bali, is how to build up communication to make sure that uh, if there is an incident uh, around Taiwan, uh, there would be a mechanism to but we avoid heard, we heard Anthony, escalade. We heard Anthony Blinken uh, telling CBS News that for now, uh, there is no restoration of a direct link between the two militaries. No, actually, uh, it was shown uh, just a few days ago uh, in Singapore when the Chinese defense minister refused to meet uh, his uh, counterpart from the U.S. Uh, he said no. But... Uh, Actually, there are contacts. Uh, you mentioned the CIA director uh, going to China. There have been many contacts. The thing is that uh, things changed since the balloon was shot down in February. Uh, now China is uh, in a more difficult position, especially on the economic side. Uh, the Chinese economy is really uh, facing a headwind, which is very strong, uh, with more than 20 percent uh, uh, young people with uh, no job. This is the first time in decades. And also the uh, GDP going down. So they need the U.S., they need the West to make sure that China will be on the good side on the economic front. Right, well, last year, uh, the U.S. imported a record amount of Chinese goods. That's the good news for Beijing. Uh, even as the value of those Chinese goods fails to keep pace with imports from the rest of the world, we can uh, show you a, a graph, perhaps, of uh, uh, what the projected trend was before, I guess, what we could call a, a trade war uh, heated up in uh, 2018. Uh, there you see that, that light blue uh, streak on, the, on your screen there is what should have been uh, the uh, increase of, again, this is the value of uh, uh, the imports of Chinese good. That didn't happen, and, and, the, and it has not reached that level yet. And so there is a sense that the U.S. is less putting its eggs in, in one basket and that the Chinese economy is facing headwinds. Uh, Ralph Winnie, uh, what do you make of uh, uh, this interdependence uh, between China and the United States? First of all, thank you for joining us from, from Washington, director at the China, of the China program uh, at the Eurasia uh, Center. Um, is the U.S. going down the right path by uh, diversifying where it gets its imports? Well, I think it's very interesting that the U.S. is recognizing um, their uh, global role in the world economy. And they are certainly looking at different options um, to diversify and not rely on China, you know, for a source of uh, semiconductors and for uh, chip technology, um, and so that we are not reliant on them. Um, the issue is going to be moving forward. How does the U.S. stay engaged and create a, a pathway moving forward for engaging with China on both of the economic and the political front? And I think it's very interesting. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Ralph. Yes, I think... Um, Washington and Beijing are going to need to think creatively about how they can manage, um, you know, the political issues against the backdrop of uh, the political pressures in the U.S. that are not going to subside. Yeah, because you heard Pierre-Antoine Pierre Denis there stating that uh, they are speaking to each other. They just can't admit it publicly. Well, that's correct. Um, and I think... What Blinken needs to do is he needs to press his Chinese interlocutors on the need to establish better crisis management mechanisms and the necessity of having a functioning military-to-military -military dialogue and crisis communications hotline. 
this is going to be very important moving forward and certainly will help to promote and stimulate um, business opportunities and interests within China. Um, between Chinese and U.S. companies and U.S. companies that are, that are trying to go to China to do business um, to ensure that, um, you know, that the governments uh, both have their back. Andre Lezikou, Pietri? Yeah, I think what we're witnessing currently, and, and I, was, I was talking about the con, uh, consistent, not the coherent strategy, consistent, uh, the Biden strategy has always been relatively uh, uh, strategic in its approach. First, there is a, a tactics. The tactics is it's now or never to have uh, communication channels because we can expect next year, electoral year in the U.S., that China will be part of the debate and that it's going to be much more difficult for any part of the uh, of the of uh, of uh, uh, being Democrat or Republican to have a very conciliatory role. I think they're also learning from history. I mean, uh, we all remember what happened during the Cuba crisis. We don't want the same to happen when basically there was no communication uh, strings between uh, between the two the the two the to military. But on the strategic side, what we're seeing on both countries happening a bit under the cover is a real decoupling happening. I mean, the Industrial Reduction Act, uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. is leading currently to a massive reindustrialization. <laughs> yes, in green technology, but it's also massively in order to become less dependent from the industrial base in China. And, and the Chinese are ramping up their efforts, especially with BRICS. We saw a lot of movements, uh, strategic movements in the last uh, weeks to, to to build up alliances, uh, um, uh, coalitions, be it on the economic and also political front. And then there is timing. I mean, I, I would like to rem remind that in 2022, there was arms uh, planned, uh, artillery delivery that was planned for Taiwan that was delayed to 2026. I don't know where it is now. So the U.S. are also playing a little bit cool by ramping up or building up the, 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 the uh, offensive or the defensive capability of of Taiwan, but the risk, everybody's focused on this very dangerous window of 2027, 2030, which is considered as the high risk period after the election in the U.S., where maybe, or during the election in the U.S., where maybe uh, the Chinese will want to go into the offensive on Taiwan. And we see that it's the only point where there was zero compromise open from the Chinese side. Yeah, there was some strong language uh, employed strong. Uh, by the uh, uh, Communist Party's top uh, uh, foreign Yi, policy chief, yeah. Wang Yi. Uh, Ralph Whitty, just let me get cross back to you on this, because uh, you, you heard what Andre was saying there. Uh, we're heading into an election year in the United States. No doubt that Joe Biden yeah. will be campaigning on uh, the fact that his uh, subsidy uh, a plan for uh, for 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 uh, transitioning to renewables, the Inflation Reduction Act, will be a centerpiece. Can he, at the same time, talk about de-escalation with China, or is that a vote loser? Um, I think there's a, a tr there's tremendous pressure in the United States to have a new policy with China in terms of uh, economic engagement. Um, China is always an election year issue in the United States. And how Biden is able to manage that, I think, is going to be very apparent moving forward. Um, the key is for the uh, U.S. to stay engaged with the Europeans uh, and to continue to develop alliances like they are doing with different countries, um, but, not, but to recognize the geopolitical importance of China's role in the global economy. But at the same time, being able to uh, stay engaged on the domestic level um, to prevent jobs um, from being outsourced, uh, but at the same time create economic opportunities in the United States and also in China. I, I want to get to this uh, very point in just one second, but first, uh, Pierre-Antoine Denet, uh, a question on the hashtag F24 debate from William. The U.S. and China are not traditional historical enemies. Will China and Russia, who are, eventually turn on each other, as they've done in the past? <laughs> uh, you know, on the Chinese side, they have been very pragmatic, and they are still very pragmatic. They are looking at the international scene evolving, and they see that probably Russia may lose the war. So uh, anticipating that, uh, the, the need to restore a more stable relationship with the United States and its allies is all the more important now. Is that what this is about, or is it the fact that Xi Jinping has now 
uh, been able to bust those term limits. He's had his re-election, and so he's in an easier position. Uh, I think it's more complicated than that because uh, you have the public picture and the non-public picture. The public picture is maybe what you just said, but not the non-public picture is that within the ranks of the CCP leaders, uh, there are a kind of dissatisfaction about mistakes being done in the near past, especially by Xi Jinping. So uh, he needs also uh, to show to the Chinese leadership that he's uh, really the man uh, to restore a positive relationship with the United States. The fact that he received uh, Mr. Blinken, of course, he had to do so, because if he didn't do that, that would be a blow uh, to the United States. He didn't want to do that. But it's also for the internal conception uh, to show the Chinese people that, uh, OK, uh, Russia is as it is now, but uh, uh, we, we want to have a more stable relationship with the United States. Uh, this is our rival, maybe not the enemy. Let's see how it goes. All right, let, let, let's talk about this idea of uh, uh, how trade relations are central to relations not just between those two superpowers, but with here in Europe. Uh, and the kind of title description worthy of a Communist Party Congress, China's prime minister, in Berlin this Monday for the seventh joint German-Chinese government consultation. A Monday night dinner with Olaf Scholz on the menu. Uh, Scholz, who recently overrode objections within his coalition to the Chinese, uh, taking a 25 percent share of the port of his hometown of Hamburg. But also just days ago, the chancellor's cabinet approving a first ever national security strategy paper, a uh, warning of an increasingly aggressive China, quote, repeatedly acting in contradiction with our interests and values. Scholz, with a bit of a typewrote act, when earlier in the day, he addressed the German Industry Association, BDI, in Berlin. The G7 has no interest in impeding China's economic rise, and at the same time, we are looking closely to avoid dangerous economic dependencies. Uh, Diane Wei Liang, sitting in Stuttgart, uh, uh, which is uh, the uh, trickier visit, uh, that of Prime Minister Li to Germany or Secretary of State Blinken uh, to Beijing? Oh, both, I believe, are quite tricky. And partly the, you know, why it is tricky is because China and the West, even though have been engaging and communicating for the past 40 years, and ultimately both sides do not understand each other. There is a huge lack of trust and understanding. And therefore, in these relationships, and there are lots of uh, testing water, and also I want to uh, echo what Ralph said uh, earlier from Washington, that um, for Xi Jinping, as well as uh, you know, President Biden or uh, Olaf Scholz, and every politician has a domestic audience. And so both sides have to deal with both the domestic um, political audience as well as the international. And it is very tricky for Germany to walk a fine balance. However, in this case, and Europe and US are not aligned 100% because, for example, for Germany, Germany has a huge trade relations with China, and there is a great deal of dependency. And to decouple that, unravel that relationship will take a long time. And that will also create political tension with China. And so Europe, particularly Germany, is in a difficult position because on one hand side is the United States and the ally of Germany. On the other side is their largest trading partner, which is China. Uh, Andre Lizzie Kukentri, is Germany in a difficult uh, relationship with Germany? I'm asking the question because you have these huge uh, uh, multinationals, uh, Volkswagen, uh, I can name all the car companies, BASF, all the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they're increasing their investment uh, in China these days. Uh, 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, wh what was just said is, a, is an understatement. I mean, uh, yes, the, the West is very fragmented, but Germany itself, I mean, you spoke about the national security strategy that was released, I think, on, on Thursday or Friday last week. This was driven by the foreign ministry, uh, who is led by a green uh, foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, which is not completely aligned with the chancellor, uh, who is from the SPD. And we saw that with the story of the port of, of Hamburg. So I think even within governments, uh, you have very, very different. I mean, this national security strategy is actually much less on Russia than people were thought, and much more on China than, than, than we could have thought. And then think about the disagreement between France and Germany on, 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 on China. And then between industry, part of industry, especially the big industry that has today between 30 and 40 percent of their revenues and sometimes more of their profit coming from China. You mentioned a few of these companies who are exerting a lot of pressure. And maybe the current move, we can also think that part of the U.S. industry is also behind uh, what is going on and in, uh, in the sort of you know, appeasement or conciliary tone, because there is a lot of pragmatism uh, going on. Then I think, again, this is tactics. On the long term, we hear the word permanently happening is the word de-risking, not decoupling, but de-risking. It's how do we decrease our dependency? Because currently, the companies that you mentioned, they have no other choice than to, to actually double down in China because they have actually lost. Is Germany more exposed to China than it was with Russia and its natural gas? I could even expand it. I think currently the whole European strategy, and it might be very strong words, uh, about the Green Deal is a strategy that is leading to much more dependency to China. Think about lithium, think about rare earth. I mean, basically, our whole transition to electricity and to circular economy is based on products and materials who are refined or coming from China. Think about batteries. And we celebrate, rightly so, a lot of gigafactories. Uh, the French president was very eager to have Elon Musk a couple of days invest in, in, in France. Did not happen yet. Um, but actually, the, 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 the share of Chinese battery makers is actually inc keep increasing as, as over 70 percent. So if we think we were dependent on Russia, we're actually becoming much more dependent on China. And this is a strategic uh, dilemma for most of the policymakers. Uh, Ralph Winnie, is are Europe and the United States going to grow more, not less dependent on China? Well, I think um, you in regards to the uh, German prime minister, um, they would like um, co -op communication strengthen between the U.S. and China. And the Germans are in a kind of a difficult position because they put out this blueprint that accused the Chinese of acting against German interests, putting international security under increasing pressure and disregarding human rights. But at the same time, um, Germany understands the necessity of getting Beijing's cooperation on fighting climate change and promoting economic opportunities. Um, so it's kind of this difficult hurdle. And I think the U.S. and Europe certainly are aligned on the human rights issues involving China. But you see France and you see Germany kind of breaking away from the U.S. when it comes to the economic side, looking to secure competitive advantage in the Chinese market despite the fact that China is experiencing economic slowdown because of sluggish exports and domestic demand has been weighing heavily on China post-COVID um, economy. Yeah. So, the, you know, so the Chinese certainly want to have that division between the U.S. and the, uh, and the United States, uh, certainly economically, and to take, um, take that advantage and push the human rights issues to the back burner. Uh, Ralph Winnie, uh, uh, there are, is a change of tone. We mentioned that uh, uh, strategy paper on the part of the Germans. Even Italy, one of the EU's most willing partners of China, has its limitations. The government stepping in over the weekend to prevent China's Sinoshem from designating the chief executive uh, tire maker Pirelli. This despite being a main yeah. shareholder with a 37 percent stake. Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney's government invoking national security concerns about the potential for misuse of Pirelli's chip technology. Pierre-Antoine Donnet, were you surprised uh, that the uh, uh, Italian government was stepping in 
to uh, to uh, basically curb China's power in investing in Italy? Well, you see, this is just another example uh, that shows that uh, the uh, situation is evolving also in the European Union. Uh, we just talked about the policy paper in Germany. We have this example in uh, Italy. And uh, the Chinese side is also very uh, worried, worried about that. And they, being pragmatic, they take that also as a new situation. Uh, when you see the, the global picture in the last few months, since this balloon was shot down, the, uh, the U.S. succeeded in uh, forging more strong uh, relationship with the, us, its allies, not only in Europe, but also in Asia, especially in Asia. So there is a sense of urgency in Beijing. Did, did, did Italy do the right thing by um, well, of course stepping they did. in? Well, as... Uh, as I see it, they, they had to do that. Well, yes, of course. Well, I mean, it's a tire maker. What's, what's so uh, strange? Because they have the experience of uh, the Chinese producing their, their own tires. Uh, the, the story has been done previously by Michelin, which, did, uh, which is the number one uh, tire producer in the world. They invested a lot of money in China, and they discovered afterwards that the Chinese side is copying what they do, and that they're producing now tires much less expensive. And uh, also, the other thing is that uh, taking over a company like Pirelli is also, uh, is also uh, political. So uh, uh, Italy was uh, one of the very few countries in the European Union to, uh, to sign a contract for the, uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, they opened two uh, ports to the Chinese. This decision also has been reversed. Uh, this is also another sign that uh, the perception of uh, China in the European is changing. And as you mentioned, now the policy is de risking. It's not decoupling, but it's not far from that. And if you see what's happening also, you mentioned that too. Uh, foreign investments in China are leaving. Uh, one after the other, the businessmen are, uh, they are deciding that uh, the safe place to be is no longer China. Ralph Winnie, you agree that it's a, the, the, the Italian government did the right thing by uh, stepping in and preventing uh, ch the, the Chinese, even though they have that 37% that stake from uh, yeah. being the decision makers at Pirelli? Well, the, the goal of the Italian government was to protect a technology that allows for advanced embedded sensors and tires that collect location and infrastructure data. And... Um, the Italians felt, you know, that um, they were going to lose this technology um, by, through the data collected by sensors in the company's tires. So I think it was a tough call for them to make, but that's where national security interests sort of prevail over business. And you have to be very careful because um, if you want the Chinese business in your country, you're going to have to make some very tough uh, decisions And certainly the Sinochem influence over Pirelli was a great concern about the data that Sinochem was collected by the sensors in the company's tires. It's, you know, um, I think Georgia Maloney claimed she was using golden power, which is a right to impose restrictions on Sinochem's access to information from the technology. Um, in an ideal world, you could protect and patent your technology. You could go through the, the court system um, and follow the WTO guidelines. Um, but people have gotten very concerned about China's aggressive approach. So, um, you know, we'll have to see moving forward, you know, if that's going to um, be a stumbling block for Chinese investment in Europe and in the U.S., yeah, uh, go, uh, gone are the days when uh, the World Trade Organization's standards for free trade uh, were the uh, hallmark when it came uh, to these uh, rivalries and tensions. Uh, once upon a time, the European Union would have raised holy hell over massive state subsidies for industry. But before his dinner with the Chinese prime minister, the German chancellor welcoming the boss of uh, Intel and showering the U.S. chip baker with 10 billion euros, a 10 billion euro grant for the construction of a factory in uh, Magdeburg that's uh, near uh, Berlin. Uh, Diane Wei Liang, once again, we're, we're talking about uh, chip technology being at the center of this all. Well, going forward, 
the technology war is definitely on, whether you, China or the West would want to admit it or not. A lot of these moves, including subsidies, and is about controlling technology is to about keeping the technology in the West versus you know, being dependent on China. And that goes behind that policy. And Intel had secured lots of subsidies from also Poland, other countries to establish factories. And this is one example, but we will see more and more. And if you we look at US-China conflict or tension in trade, a lot of that is focused on technology. And as I said earlier, that um, after 40 years of development um, for China, uh, we reached a crossroad where the world realized that China is becoming competitive, not just becoming so you know, being a, a low cost manufacturing center but in terms of technology that has a much bigger implication to trade but also to security and uh, policy and and you know, stability of the world order so this is why a big transition is happening between china and the west in terms of policies including trade and political policies and we will see this um, tension and risk, de-risk, and played out over the few, you know, in the future, a much more um, complex way and a much more sort of, you know, risky ways because the stakes yeah, is are it, high. Is, is it de-risking or is it increasing uh, the risk? Andre Lizakuk Petri, uh, first of all. What's 10 billion euros? That's not chump change here. I know, that's absolutely... That's a huge subsidy. I, I'm, I'm going to be very blunt on this one. I think the German government is panicking because basically what the other will read of that is the German government is putting 10 billion into a chip maker who has no experience in doing these 10 nanometers. So we are going to basically pay with 250 euro per German citizen that's a lot of money, uh, a U.S. chip maker that is going to install a factory in, uh, at the door of Berlin. Uh, and we're going to pay his curve of experience, his experience curve. Um, one could argue probably a smarter strategy, but if you had a little bit more foresight, would have been to increase the, the, the European or German capabilities in chip making and, and use this money to build its own giant. Yeah, but you can't do that with the snap of a finger. And this is nope. something we've been talking about for decades. And, and, and this is why the two main topics here that we can see is, number one, very interesting, uh, the U.S. was always famous for seeing everything as national security. We begin to see exactly the same thing happening in, in Europe. Uh, these cyber tires of Pirelli, which give out location data, obviously, that becomes uh, uh, national security. So that is interesting as an alignment between the U.S. and Europe. The second thing is we can uh, see that the Europeans are three, four, five years late in discovering that actually having Syngenta, having Pirelli, having uh, uh, KUKA, this is, is a famous robotic maker in Germany, Chinese, is actually not just good business, but they're increasing their dependency. So I think that Europeans currently are panicking because, number one, they did not have this foresight, Try to to keep what can be kept and attract with desperate subsidy money uh, U.S. investments. I must say on that one, the U.S. government has been much more strategic, uh, also with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a way to very simply uh, bring billions of, of uh, industrial euros back to, uh, back to the U.S. Pierre-Antoine Drey? I think uh, dependency is the key word. Uh, recently, a few uh, European leaders said that uh, we should learn from Russia uh, war in Ukraine being less dependent. That includes China. Uh, Thierry Breton, who is uh, the High Commissioner for Technology, said that recently. So learning this lesson means that uh, they have to be cautious about what China is doing in the world. But I would add that... So is it better then to... to, to so you're cautious about China, so instead... Uh, you uh, sign with uh, the United States. Intel CEO hailing yeah, the agreement as the single largest foreign direct investment ever by Germany. Yeah, but look, Intel is not the single uh, chip producer. 
by far it's not the number one today. It's TSMC, the Taiwanese one. And what is TMC, TSMC doing? They are going to open, in a few years from now, a giant uh, uh, producing company in Germany, producing not 10 nanometers chip, but five or three nanometers chips there yeah, less is in, more Dresden, about in chips. Dresden, in Germany. Why in Germany? Because uh, the Taiwanese leadership also knows how to uh, use the economic tool as a political tool as well. So they are investing uh, for the chip, for example, in Germany, in Japan, in the United States. And uh, this is not known, perhaps, but they are also offering the same for France, for the latest technology. Is, go is France going to take that offer? I don't know. Should they? Of course they should. <laughs> because uh, we, uh, Diana said uh, very rightly that uh, today the, the war is about uh, technology. Who is going to master the technology is going to be the real master. So uh, for this, subsidies in China for decades, subsidies in the United States, you mentioned this Inflation Reduction Act, now big subsidies here in Europe as well. Is this just normal, good, bad? Yeah, but let's let's think again about the Chinese strategy for the last 40 years. It was subsidies, but in order to have the local champions emerge. And that's what, what you just mentioned, is that these takeovers overs of uh, foreign companies were a way also to get to go much faster on the experience curve. So I think this is what the, the Europeans should keep in mind. Is It's not just about creating 4,000 jobs in Magdeburg, because these jobs in a semiconductor factory are not net plus. These, these people would have another job, and they're actually even uh, taking these jobs away from smaller uh, chip makers uh, in, in Germany. It's going to be a much more competitive labor market. The question is, how strategic are we not to be just in Europe a playground uh, for the foreign actors, Chinese or American, uh, you know, out-marketing uh, us. And the same thing is happening. Elon Musk is doing exactly the same. He's saying the same to Mr. Macron, to Mr. Scholz, uh, uh, to, uh, to Mr. Sunak in the UK. And the, the person who is going to put the most uh, subsidies is going to win. But are we really building up our own capabilities? I doubt it. Sam Altman from OpenAI did exactly the same tour. I think... Uh, you know, especially American leaders, uh, p uh, business leaders now know very well how to play our commissioner for industry, how to play our local leaders, and I'm not so sure the European will be the winners in this uh, in this uh, in this technology war. At least not with the current. Uh, they're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money, but are we really building up our own industry and our own uh, resilience? I severely doubt it in the current state. Uh, Ralph Winnie, any any advice for us here on this side of the Atlantic on uh, how to uh, handle at the same time the Chinese and the Americans when it comes to such strategic interviews as chip technology? Well, I <laughs> I think the European Union, as we know, um, has rolled out a plan to double the block share of global chip production to 20% by 2030 and mobilize billions of euros in investment. Um, we have tiny Taiwanese tech giant TSMC, one of the world's leading chip companies, built, considering to build its first European plan in the eastern city of Dresden. I think the key is going to be, you know, how, are, how is the EU going to pay for this? They want to make it easier for sustainable companies to access tax breaks redirecting cash toward clean tech industries and relaxed state aid rules. But if they enter a subsidy, a subsidy race, then um, the EU ends up paying a lot of money, and it's not necessarily any safer. That's what Clemens Forst, president of German's IFO Institute, said. Um, the semiconductor supply chain involves many different companies providing different services, and it's destined to remain globalized. But it's important for the U.S. and the Europeans to work together to continue to harness new um, sources for the, the chips technology. As um, Olaf Schultz said, semiconductors are often referred to as the petroleum of the 21st century. That way we don't have to rely on Russia and or China for this uh, technology. Um, so I think it's good that Infian is planning to invest 5 billion euros in the plants. 
that's due to open in 2026 and create up to 1,000 jobs in Dresden. How is the U.S. going to respond? Are we going to continue under the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, to create these kind of opportunities in the U.S.? And I think we are going to. And I think at the end of the day, with stimulus money and funding going into this on the U.S. side, um, there is so much potential and our economies are going to continue to grow and and, uh, develop. All right, so a subsidy race uh, is definitely on between uh, the U.S., China, and uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, Ralph Winnie, I want to thank you for joining us from Washington. I want to thank Diane uh, Wei-Liang for being with us uh, from Stuttgart. Uh, André Lezikog Pietri, Pierre-Antoine Donnet, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.